Let me open up for uh, discussion, comments, questions. Um, we have uh, several colleagues with mics around the room, so if you'd like to make some comments, just uh, raise your hands so I can see. And then uh, would you tell us your name and institution? And what I may do, Per and Robert, if it's okay with you, is collect uh, two or three or four, give you a chance to quickly respond, and then come back. I think I see Gilles at the back there. And Yes, uh, thank you, Mike. Question is for Per. Uh, my name is Gilles Bergeron. I'm with the Food and Nutrition Technical Assistance Project. And uh, <clears throat> at Fanta, what we do is technical assistance. It's not research, uh, uh, upstream research. Uh, and our, our uh, main concern is always the implementation side, the how. And I would like to refer to uh, your last slide pair that uh, lists the challenges uh, of a sectorally divided um, approaches that we have now and your advocacy of breaking out of the silos uh, and <clears throat> again here our preoccupation is uh, that's very fine in theory but how do you do that and we have uh, adopted as a uh, uh, kind of a, a motto or a modus vivendi as of now uh, the idea that we need to uh, plan collectively but implement sectorally so my question is, uh, is that something that uh, you think uh, you're comfortable with, or what is needed? Uh, do we need to uh, train or the, to the evolve uh, totally new job descriptions that are plur pluridisciplinary to start with, or is this notion of planning collectively and implementing uh, sectorally uh, acceptable? Thank you. Thank you, Gilles. I thought I saw a hand, yes, right there. There's a mic coming your way in a moment. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Jerry Martin. I'm the director of the health sector at DAI and formerly was the director of the agriculture sector there. So what I would like to uh, comment on is the observation that in the past four years, there's not been too much progress in working between the agriculture and health sectors. But I think in many ways avian influenza has turned out to be a very beneficial disease in that regard because uh, USAID uh, has been leading an effort to promote the uh, collaboration between veterinary medicine and uh, uh, human medicine and also looking at the economics that drive that. And I think that one of the issues that I would like to see addressed a little bit more would be these issues of the economic incentives in the production of animal protein. How, the, how people decide and to procure animal protein, whether it's you know, through um, bushmeat or whether it's through large concentrated animal production systems that may be the source of these diseases, uh, is all ultimately driven by the economics that they face. And I, I see in Indonesia where we've been working for the last four years the incentives that uh, small-scale poultry producers who are linked into the multinational integrators, they, need, they don't care about avian influenza. What they care about is the productivity and the profitability of their operation. So the biosecurity program that we designed with some of the large uh, multinationals, CP and CIRAD, actually never mentioned avian influenza. What it meant, mentioned was good farming practices and how to improve the production and pro productivity of their birds. And in turn, that actually would create a public good because it reduced the transmission of the virus. Thank you very much. You actually straddle both the agriculture and the health sectors, and one could have an interesting seminar on how you cope. But uh, thank you. Do I have any one uh, more question? Otherwise, I'd like to come, because these are two very meaty issues on the table for you, Per and Robert. And actually, both of them might be things you may want to pick up. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you very much. Um, whoa. Yes, Jill, I think the, maybe the only pragmatic way of dealing with this at this point is to plan intersectorial and implement sectorial simply because the institutions that you're working with are to a very large extent sectorial. So in the very short term, I think what you are suggesting is the only real pragmatic way to deal with it. But I think in the somewhat longer term, we need to do a lot more uh, training of our students, the people who are going to replace us, 
and they'll replace me long before they replace you. Um, to, um, to think intersectorial, the IGOT programs of the National Science Foundation that some of you may be familiar with, uh, those programs do exactly that, or at least that's the aim. But we need to do a lot more like this. We don't have to create generalists. We have to create people who have the depth <coughs> in one discipline, but enough understanding of the other disciplines so they can work in teams, so they understand the importance of a holistic systems type approach. Mm -hmm. But that's a somewhat longer, longer term solution, but that's something we have to start on now. We need to provide incentives, uh, both in research and in policy making and in advice, um, to multi-sectorial uh, or multidisciplinary approaches. And there are many incentives, of course, that can be considered. Uh, they don't all have to be monetary. There are a number of incentives. For example, um, if I'm a an, an, um, non-tenured assistant professor at a university and I would like to get tenure within the next few years, I'm not going to do research on multidisciplinary things. I'm going to be very disciplinary because that's where the top journals are and I want to publish my stuff in refereed journals and they are to a very, very large extent uh, silo-based. You can pick one silo or the other, but if you try to integrate two or three, chances are that you won't get uh, tenure. So, so there are incentives for researchers. Um, let me just very briefly address uh, Jerry Martin's point as well. Uh, avian flu is a very interesting uh, case because uh, we try to kill all the birds in sight. When you would think that in 2010 we would be a little smarter than that. And of course the reason we're not is that we haven't yet figured out the, we haven't yet done the research to introduce resistance to these kinds of things in the birds and find a way uh, pragmatically uh, make those birds resistant or in some other way deal with that, dealing with that problem. I'm not so sure that you are running a bigger health risk or food safety risk in large scale production than in small scale production of animals. Uh, what happens in the, when, when something goes wrong in the large scale, like the egg business in Iowa, it hits the front pages of all the newspapers. But if you think of a lot of small scale enterprises, animal production enterprises, a lot of things go wrong, but they're not reported because they don't affect thousands and thousands of people. So I think we, we really need a, need a lot more research to understand what production system is a most appropriate one from a health and an economic perspective, because obviously the two somehow should go together. Uh, just to reinforce what Per said about what sort of professionals we need to promote the intersectoral, it's absolutely true. We cannot have generalists, but we need some. We need people who have some depth in one particular discipline, so that they have the respect and the and the ear of their peers. But at the same time, you then need people not so much with knowledge, but with the skills to um, interact with people from other disciplinary backgrounds to get this intersectoral act together. Um, also, as for planning collectively and implementing sectorally, that sounds like a very practical approach, and I think that at least it's a good beginning, uh, but it would require quite a good monitoring system to ensure that once you have planned collectively and, and agreed on certain functions to be performed by the different sectors, um, that compliance with those agreements is actually um, also in order. Um, and then, of course, um, about the um, uh, the bird flu and also the, you know, these, these are incidental issues that have led to a lot of collaboration internationally and then also trickle down to the national level. Uh, but we still lack a sort of systematic approach to this. We cannot go from one uh, crisis to the other and, and each time when there is a crisis we get the intersectoral business going, but it would be better if it were just happening across the board. And it's very important th this notion that 
as long as you can capture the primary interest, for instance, of farming communities, um, to do things that are um, that make sense to their agricultural production system, but also um, have a public health spin-off, that that is the best way to mainstream and also make it sustainable. One example of that was when we worked in South India on Japanese encephalitis, which is a disease transmitted by mosquitoes that breed in rice fields. Um, you know, we we couldn't get the farmers to really sleep on the bed net. They prefer to sleep outside most of the time because it's very hot in South India. Um, and so they were not protected. But when they had a problem with water scarcity and we instructed them how to manage their water better, um, also bearing in mind how that then would influence the ecology of the mosquito and their breeding, um, that was when we got them on board and they, they adopted those methods and also indirectly contributed to reducing the, the health risks as they existed. Let me open up for another round, but as I do that, I would also like to ask a question on the incentives and following on this conversation. The, do we need to go outside of the agriculture and the health and the nutrition arenas and have an injection of incentives from outside? What is the potential for the planning ministries, the finance ministries to basically, can they be major drivers of change in incentives? Because are we are we restricting ourselves by the incentives, quote unquote, that we are familiar with in our, quote, in our agricultural health arenas, and those incentives are just too narrow? So I don't quite know whether you see potential for how then to get the finance ministries or the planning ministries or heads of state themselves to think and push the incentives. Because otherwise, if we leave it only to the agriculture and the health sectors, I'm so afraid we'll remain within our band of known incentives. Not that I want to get into the knowns and the unknowns here, um, but let me open up. I see Kathy, and I see also a hand over here. But Kathy, why don't you go first? Thank you very much for these wise comments. I'm Kathleen Kurz from um, Academy for Educational Development, Africa's Health in 2010 Project. Um, you've uh, mentioned several times um, research, and I want to um, ask you what priorities are for research as, you know, getting sectors to work together, both are skeptical that, well, will that be a better use of, um, of my funds than just staying in the sector? And we have plenty of work to do within the sector, and it takes so much time to collaborate anyway. Um, and a lot of times we don't have the, the, the evidence to say, you'll get this much further if we do it together. Now you've already given some examples, but I wondered if you could give us some um, prioritize that in nutrition people we've focused a lot in the in the health sector and and have a lot of knowledge there and less about how food um, obviously enough but how 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 food can improve nutrition what do we need to do um, and will it will it have payoffs so I'd just be interested to hear what from each of your perspectives what would you think were the priorities um, to do more intersectoral work or make the argument for intersectoral outcomes? Kathy, thank you, Kathy. Let me come to David and... Uh... Thank you. Uh, David Lambert, uh, DPL Associates. Uh, a few months back, Nina Fedorov, this is somewhat related to the last question. Nina Fedorov at a Feed the Future conference uh, made the statement that uh, in the U.S., even though its impact is global, in the U.S., Agricultural research budgets are about 1 to 2 percent of biomedical research budget. It would seem to be quite a paradox since so much of agricultural research is about preventing those problems that medical research later has to deal with, like nutrition, uh, child nutrition and obesity and climate change and bioenergy and food safety and all the rest. Um, to comment. And we have one now. Uh um, question over there. Hi, my name is Jessica Tillohun. Uh, I work at Global Food and Nutrition, but I'm working with Tufts University on the Food Aid Quality Review. Um, my question is also referencing the Feed the Future. Do you feel possibly that the, the new initiatives that they are rolling out and planning on rolling out and all the talk, do you think this will help integration of all of these players, integrating ag and nutrition, maybe not so much other players. Um, also, as far as getting people who are multidisciplinary able to see, you know, have a specialty in one area, but also see the relevance of 
The other area is, um, in my experience, I was working with um, the development of the National Nutrition Program in Ethiopia with the World Bank and UNICEF, et cetera, and our goal was getting the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, Nutrition, Ministry of Mines, because of Idai Salt, all around the same table saying, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And I found that my colleagues that were born and raised in Ethiopia, attending university in Ethiopia, maybe they got a degree in agriculture or health, were far better minded in understanding the linkages that needed to happen in all of that and how it all played a role because they were there. And I was wondering maybe your thoughts on the development of those universities, development, you know, bringing the specialties from the people who grew up living it. Thank you very much. Per and Robert, can, why don't I o t take, uh, give you a chance to respond and then I'll open up a next round. I see several other hands. It's definitely true, referring to the last question, that the um, uh, people in developing countries tend to have this much better comprehensive concept. And I, I've always wondered about that too, because I think that maybe it's because often they come from um, uh, rural realities where they, where they have lived the, these things much better than we can ever imagine coming from an urban environment. Um, because when you're in a farming community, you don't divide your time up between one hour health, one hour agriculture, etc. It's all part of the whole reality, right? Um, so they also see these links maybe often much better. Um, the, the question with respect to the funding of um, biomedical research, I think that the, the um, general misconception here is that we mix up public health research and biomedical research. And I think when you deduct the typical biomedical and pharmaceutical research funds from the overall budget, then, and you look at public health research, which is really what we're talking about here when we try to link health to um, agriculture, then you will find out that um, that's only a very small percentage of the overall budget that you're then talking about. And in fact, when we, when we were at one point starting the um, this malaria program that ran at IMI for a while. Um, uh, the director general then at IMI, Frank Reisberman, sort of said, oh, we're starting this malaria program. Now we will have access to funds we normally as an agriculture research center never have access to. Um, you know, this will bring in much more funding. And I told him, you know, don't make yourself any illusions because the money that is actually available for public health malaria research is very, very limited. And unfortunately, that also turned out to be true. Um, with respect to research priorities, um, you already said it yourself, the, the first thing is to create more evidence, and, and evidence not only in the sense of what we would like to see from public health, but evidence that actually is compelling both to people in the agriculture sector, but also to ministers of finance and uh, ministers of planning, because those are the ones you want to then influence to get budget allocations um, redirected. Um, and that also brings in the second topic, I think, you know, the whole economic background and the evaluation of different ways of intervening in these diseases and, you know, the sectoral versus the intersectoral approach. Um, that needs a lot more research. And then, of course, the impacts in a contextualized manner. It's very nice to say sort of broad sweeping statements about the links between agriculture and health, but we'll have to look in specific settings and see uh, what the reality on the ground is and what we can actually do about it, what the limitations and the opportunities are um, to take some of these intersectoral measures. And finally, um, yes, incentives, Rajul. I think that the, um, um, the, the, we have gone through experience now because in WHO, in my unit, we do the monitoring of water and sanitation for the MDG target. Uh, but we've just started a new assessment which looks at the enabling environment for that. Why are some countries on track for the MDG target on water and sanitation? Why others are not? And so we have this global annual assessment on uh, sanitation and drinking water that looks at resource streams, both you know the policy environment, institutional uh, linkages, human resource base, and most importantly, the funding streams, both the international uh, official development uh, assistance, but also at the country level, where does money go? And, and, um, and by 
putting these informations together, you create a sort of information base that then helps you find where the incentives are. Um, and the information, for instance, we got about um, uh, funding streams at national and international level, we put forward to this group of ministers of finance last April here at the during the World Bank spring meetings and, and, and sort of got them to listen to the case for water and sanitation, why it's a good idea to invest in it um, and why uh, they have to redirect their funding streams. And I think if you create sufficient uh, evidence on that for um, agriculture, you can also influence them and give them an incentive to um, focus on these issues as well. Uh, let me just, um, I agree with, uh, with what Bob has said. Let me just add a, a few co additional comments. Um, what makes governments prioritize things is whether they think it will strengthen their legitimacy. That's priority number one for every government, whether it's elected, appointed, or it came in there by force. Therefore, if we can convince finance ministers, and they, of course, are usually the most powerful ministers in the, ca in the cabinet next to the president. If we can convince the finance ministers that improved health and improved nutrition will strengthen the government's legitimacy, maybe because it increases productivity and therefore economic growth, Maybe it does something else that governments like, whatever that may be. And, and I am certainly not about to mention anything like corruption, but there are things that governments are looking for, and if they can find those things uh, by improving health and nutrition, yes, then I think we have uh, an opportunity. Usually the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture are very weak ministries, so I completely agree with you with the idea that we need to go beyond those ministries if we are to influence governments to do some of the things that we're talking about. This is true whether we're talking about integration between uh, the food system and human health or we're simply talking about improving health and nutrition uh, in a more of a, a traditional way. Um, uh, Kathy, the research priorities, you know a lot more about this than I do, but uh, because we worked uh, together before, but, but it seems to me that a lot of the research that's needed is context specific, and therefore we can't really set priorities for it here. Uh, where we, I think, do need some more international, some more general priority type research is on the processes. How do we uh, create the kinds of incentives that we would be looking for if we want to integrate the food system and human and human health. And the way to do that, in my opinion, would be, uh, I think what Bob was saying also, uh, do some case studies. There are countries uh, that have attempted this, some with more success than others. The SCN has actually done quite a bit of work on this as it relates to nutrition. Uh, trying to show how um, the various institu existing institutions could come together around nutrition improvement. There is very little done on this around other health uh, links to the food system. It has been mostly on the nutrition side, and of course that's very important. So I think there is an area where uh, by using some case studies and doing some comparative analysis, uh, we could actually uh, begin to understand better how to move this ahead if that is what we want to do. Um, I think, uh, Bob, you already addressed uh, the other. Uh, one other thing um, on the uh, whether the Feed the Future will in fact help integrating the food system and uh, human health. Um, as far as I understand Feed the, uh, Feed the Future, that is not a goal of Feed the Future. The goal of Feed the Future is to feed the future, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that it will strengthen the link between the food system and nutrition. I'm much less sure about the interaction between the food system and the other health uh, aspects. Then They, I don't believe, are really mentioned in the Feed the Future uh, documents. So I, I think Bob has dealt with the other questions. Thank you very much, Per. Let me take the last round of questions, uh, comments. Robert, you were, had your hand up, and then uh, Lady. Bob Thompson, recently retired University of Illinois. Um, 
You both just uh, started to respond to what I was going to ask about, but I'd like to push it a little further, and that is that agriculture and rural development have been off the global development agenda since the 1980s. Uh, nutritional deficiencies uh, have seemed to have been crowded off the global health agenda uh, in a similar period uh, with uh, development of pharmaceuticals to tre treat diseases caused by pathogens, develop uh, immunizations to prevent diseases caused by, by pathogens being the two principal claimants of the world health, devel health uh, uh, development agenda. Uh, do you think by, can we, by working together, do a better job of getting both issues back onto the, or onto the uh, high income countries development agenda. Uh, Feed the Future uh, is great in the sense that it has the administration's uh, attention, uh, but we're in this terribly tight budget environment, it's going to be extremely difficult to get U.S. Congress funding for this initiative or, uh, or any other new initiative. And, uh, and of course in Europe, only Spain has put any of the money it pledged into the uh, into the facility at the World Bank, and so uh, perhaps there's even bigger problem in Europe than there is on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, but do you think we can, by marrying these two interests, uh, do both do better? Thank you. I had promised we'd end the session at 1:45 for those online. So I'll ask people to be brief and have some comments. Madame, you are next. Thank you very much. Let me thank the speakers uh, for their very invaluable input. My name is Vangileti Timsumza. I'm from the South African Embassy. Um, I'm from a country that takes nutrition, health, and agriculture very seriously. But I think the major problem is how to translate the frameworks into actions. And I was wondering if there are any examples that can be shared and I've heard people talk about case studies that could be of value in terms of seeing how we can translate all these ideas into actual uh, actions on the ground. In South Africa, quickly, we have an integrated food security and nutrition um, program. Um, I think it's been on, on the cards for about four or five years. Uh, I think the gridlock is that people don't know what to do going forward. Thanks. Thank you very much. There was uh, another lady here. Uh, yes, hi. I'm Jane Early. I've worked with the food industry, and I'm now working with the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry. And my observation, um, which is, uh, is that in both industries, there are global supply chains that are hugely important. I've been very interested in the connections that you've made between health and food. Um, but I wonder, are there opportunities to leverage these global supply systems to help provide funding for some of these initiatives? Thank you very much. Why don't I turn over to you both, Robert and Pear, and if you want to also take the opportunity to make any sort of final comments or reflections, this would be the time to do that too. Um, Bob, I think it's, it's hard to imagine that if we could somehow add a, an improved health goal to the effort to improve food security and reduce malnutrition, that that wouldn't have a positive effect. That would tend to move some of the donors more in the direction we want them to go. Um, but there is actually quite a bit of money flowing uh, to agricultural development now, uh, thanks to the uh, Lagila meeting in, in Italy where the G8 and a bunch of others, I guess it ended up being G20 plus, uh, where they uh, promised to, to send a lot of money. Um, I'm chairing an advisory board for the World Bank for the GASP program, which uh, aims to allocate some of that money. And some of the proposals we're looking at actually do make the link uh, between agricultural development and food security and nutrition. None of them make the link to the other health aspects. It is li limited to the nutrition and, um, uh, and, and food security, which of course is, is a major step in the right direction. Um, so, so yes, I think by integrating, there is a chance that we can strengthen the argument for getting more money for both. Uh, how successful we will be in, in the, the current economic climate is, is very difficult to, to say. Uh, on the case studies, Madam, um, there are case studies on the um, 
food system nutrition and the integrated nutrition approaches that we can, that we can uh, identify. There are also some case studies on HIV AIDS and the food system. Uh, there may be case studies in some of the other health uh, aspects, but I'm not, I'm not aware of them at this point. So there are some case studies that would help us understand how to implement. And, and I completely, uh, I have a lot of sympathy for the position that, that those of us in academia can develop all kinds of flowcharts, but when it comes to implementing these things, it's <laughs> we tend to hide under, the, under our desk. <laughs> so there is a need to, to move this into the implementation phase. I completely agree, and I think some of the case studies uh, have, actually, have actually done that. Uh, Jane, I don't know whether the global um, uh, support system, I, I, you, you think of some of the large multinational corporations, I suppose, whether they would fund some of that? Um, I, is that what you were thinking? Yeah. Right. Right. And some of them for, for uh, less obvious uh, benefit, and some right. of these things have quite broad benefits right. in terms of uh, both agricultural practices and uh, laying the foundation for better sure. treatment of chronic diseases. Right. So there's quite a bit uh, in, in, in under the rubric of social uh, responsibility kinds of things. So some 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 of them are that way, yeah. It raises sure. an interesting question. In, in this entire discussion, we haven't talked about the role of the private sector to, no. to be the injection of change. Right. Is that something? Maybe that's for the next seminar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would like to also say that uh, there are uh, a, a lot of case studies around that, that do so or support this approach of intersectoral collaboration for health. Um, so some of them are, of course, from an era that we can say, well, you know, it was all very nice at the time and it worked very well. This is mainly sort of what happened before the Second World War in many of the colonial countries. And, um, and of course, that's a sort of nostalgic argument that doesn't really cut any ice. But we do have also examples of um, a solid collaboration between sectors um, that has happened after that. Um, what you often see, though, is that in these um, collaborations, the, um, in the end, the commercial um, interests sort of gain um, the overhand. And then um, it's often the, the people that promote drugs or insecticides or whatever um, that have a longer breath to sort of keep things going than the ones that try to sort of keep the intersectoral efforts going. So, so that is an issue that will, you know, that will need to be addressed, and we have to see how we can overcome it. There is also the issue of, you know, um, what is this continued focus on pathogens, etc., and is there really not something, anything positive going on? Well, of course, the picture is never really black and white. For instance, because of the various zoonoses and that we've had crisis around the last uh, decade. Um, in that area, there is now a very strong collaboration between WHO, FAO, and the um, World Animal Health Organization um, in an effort that is called One Health, where they're trying to sort of link those three up and promote an integrated approach to it. Similarly, um, in response, for instance, to the Stockholm um, Convention on uh, Persistent Organic Pollutants, um, there's been a lot of effort supported by the Global Environment Facility to combine integrated vector management for diseases like malaria, filariasis, etc., um, to combine that with integrated pest management in agroecosystems so that you can get the synergies out of those two very similar approaches. So it's not all bleak and terrible, but I think that the message really is that uh, those, those experiences should be documented much better, brought to the attention of the key decision makers, and then we can build on that to expand these approaches um, to other cases. Aaron, Robert, thank you both for making truly very interesting, very thought-provoking presentations. I will not summarize them because they were very rich, but what I took away, you know, one of the messages I took away from yours, pair was the importance of thinking food systems. Because I, I, I heard you say that very clearly all the way through, and not quote unquote the way we think agriculture per se. You broadened that, and then you made the linkages back and forth, health food systems. That was a very important contribution that I think we should take away. Robert, what I also took away from what you said, many different things, but also the challenge 
to think beyond the agriculture and the health arenas to find ways to bring in from outside of those arenas to find a way to recharge the way we look at these. And you were also, I think, relatively harsh on your own sector, health sector, in terms of putting some of the burden back on how the health sector can find ways to interact with the agriculture sector and pair also agriculture and health. You both of you raised the issues of capacity, of training, of of helping people to be better equipped down the road and think in different ways and act in different ways. And I think that is very important issues of capacity that are being put on the table. So not just incentives now, but also making it possible so that down the road you don't necessarily have to keep the incentives going in the stream forever. Many, many interesting different points. I think you helped us to think through of the interactions, but also of the opportunities uh, in which we can find ways to have these sectors collaborate from research to business mm -hmm. to communities to governments. Um, so thank you both for a very rich set of presentations. Please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>